Welcome to Bottled Petrichor, a podcast dedicated to discussing key topics in Islamic history and thought. In addition to a short lecture at the start of most episodes, we ask our guest experts questions submitted by listeners and allow them to share their thoughts in a safe environment. Please visit our Twitter page for feedback and question submission forms. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy. Welcome. Uh, I'm very happy to have uh, today Professor Muder who was my TA when I was a student at the University of Chicago. Welcome, Professor Muder. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, I wanted to just start and ask you a bit about yourself. What got you interested in the study of uh, the early Islamic period and just anything you want like to say about yourself and your research interests? Sure. So um, I, am, I just graduated uh, with my PhD from the University of Chicago about a year ago. Um, and now it feels like I've been studying Islamic, particularly early Islamic history for um, most of my adult life, but um, I grew up in the rural south in the U.S. and had no exposure to Islam essentially growing up, Um, and then in college had a a very inspiring professor in a sort of general um, philosophy course, and I took the next thing she taught, which was a class on the Quran, and um, it totally sort of changed the way that I thought about religion and the way that I sort of thought even about education and my own academic um, development. And um, so I switched um, my focus from economics to um, Islamic history and continued on from there. After that, I, um, well, worked in finance for a few years, but um, completed a master's at the American University in Cairo um, in Middle Eastern history, Um, studied quite a lot of Arabic, and then... um, came to the University of Chicago um, in the in the NELP program and studied with Red Donor there. So um, I'm particularly interested in questions surrounding conversion and sort of who joined the early Muslim movement, that's how I'm going to describe it, um, and why and sort of what did that, what effect did that have on, on the early Muslim community? Those are some of the questions that um, sort of draw me in to the field. Um, among others. I'm a postdoctoral fellow, um, a Mellon postdoctoral fellow in religion at Bowdoin College, um, where I teach about Islam. Um, I've also taught a class on religious conversion. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's been very enjoyable. Wonderful, wonderful. I um, I also had the good fortune of, of, of studying under the professor, and I benefited greatly uh, from the time that I spent as uh, one of her students. And I think it was Professor Lewis's class, especially in terms of right. uh, writing, very, very wonderful experience. And I'm, again, very, very grateful and happy to have you on. Um, I want to. Just... You always ask incredible questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah. I wanted to start off asking uh, you if you could kindly give a brief, I guess, lecture about the, the conquests and the early dynasties. Sure, sure. Um... So early Islamic history um, is, I mean, in some ways it's very straightforward. We have um, sources that tell us sort of what happened, um, in what order, and that sort of thing. I will eventually um, talk about the way that we can analyze those sources, but I'll start with a general overview of what that history says, what the the sort of standard narrative of Islamic history says. So we, um, where to begin? We... Um, the conquest essentially started under uh, the Prophet Muhammad, um, and under um, his leadership, they were mostly confined to the Arabian Peninsula, um, and um, mostly with a focus on, or toward the end of his life, with a focus on um, Mecca um, and gaining the support of various tribes in and around the Hejaz. Um, so the conquest began under the Prophet Muhammad. Um, under him and his successor, Abu Bakr, um, Ibn Abi Qahafa, um, they were largely confined to the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and these were mostly about gaining and then maintaining legitimacy for the early Islamic movement. Um, Muhammad um, sought political alliances with tribes in order to expand support for his movement, um, which was mostly about um, the message of the Quran. Um, so these were both religious alliances, but they were also political alliances. Um, and, um, after exile from Mecca, um, there was a strong focus on returning to Mecca, um, 
and winning over the sort of uh, hardline rejectors of this message um, there. Um, after several attempts, um, Mecca was successfully uh, conquered in, um, depending on who you ask, 629 or 630 Common Era, eight, uh, the year 8 Hijri. Um, and after that, he and uh, his followers support, uh, focused on expanding the early Muslim movement throughout the Arabian Peninsula. Now, as we know, Muhammad died suddenly, in, or relatively suddenly, in 632. Uh, common era without explicitly naming a successor, though two clear candidates emerged, um, Abu Bakr uh, ibn Abi Kahfa, as I mentioned, and Ali ibn Abi Talib. Um, eventually, the succession issue would come to a head um, in the form of a crisis, but for now, um, Abu Bakr was selected at Fakifa under slightly contentious circumstances, um, and he ruled for two years from 632 to 634. Um, and under his rule, the main concern was essentially the loss of all of the political alliances that Muhammad had made during his lifetime. Um, with, the, um, with the death of the Prophet, um, many of the tribes that Muhammad had allied with in the Arabian Peninsula um, saw this as the end of the alliance that they had made. They had made an alliance with this man, um, not necessarily a permanent sort of allyship toward this movement per se. Um, so under Abu Bakr, um, the um, conquests were largely confined to essentially reconquering all of all of these groups. Um, this was called the, the Ribda Wars. Ribda is, basically means apostasy, so the apostasy wars. Um, and uh, this was the case throughout the Arabian Peninsula. Um, this is important because it essentially is the only time in Islamic history, um, particularly early Islamic history, where we have a clear case of forced conversion, um, large-scale forced conversion. Um, many people um, associate the early Islamic conquests with um, widespread um, instances of forced conversion, that is, that's not the case. Um, for the most part, people were given the option of converting or leaving or paying a tax or fighting. Many different options were available to them. Only in the case of the Riddha Wars, the wars of apostasy, were, was conversion um, forced in that you had the option to return to Islam or um, to fight with the assumption being sort of a fight to the death, right? Um, and that is because apostasy is punishable um, by death, and this is, this is in um, the Quran. And so this is the only instance where we have cases of forced conversion. So um, Abu Bakr um, led the Ridda Wars for the most part, um, reconverted all of these tribes in the Arabian Peninsula, um, and then made plans or set plans in place for continued expansion of the movement outside of the Arabian Peninsula. Um, by and large, um, so the um, conquests were rapidly expanded under his successor, Omar ibn al-Khattab, um, but under Abu Bakr, um, the invasions of greater Syria and Iraq um, were ordered, but he himself did not live to see them carried out. Um, the conquests are, um, in Arabic, the conquests are described or referred to as the futhat, which is to say the opening. So opening the, the region to Islam was sort of the focus. Um, so under Abu Bakr's successor, Omar bin al-Khattab, who ruled from 634 to 644, um, the early Islamic caliphate expanded significantly. Um, Omar's caliphate is notable um, for a number of things, but particularly for the vast area um, of land that was um, um, conquered under um, his caliphate. And so over the course of these 10 years, um, the caliphate expanded to incorporate um, all of Iraq, a significant portion of Iran, um, 
as well as areas of Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia, the Caucasus, basically. Um, all of greater Syria, which includes Jordan, Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, um, as well as Egypt, which was quite possibly conquered without his permission. Um, and parts even of southwestern Pakistan um, and areas of Central Asia, um, including Afghanistan um, and even parts of Turkmenistan. Um, the Sasanian Empire um, ceased to exist during this period. It was um, essentially completely um, subsumed uh, into the Caliphate. Um, and the Byzantine Empire also contracted significantly, um, the main exception being the Anatolian Peninsula, which has its own sort of narrative, which we'll get to. Um, so, let's see. Um, there are very interesting narratives about the different regions that were conquered under Omar. Um, Egypt, like I said, was conquered um, basically without his permission. It was invaded by Omar ibn al-As um, and only sort of retroactively um, did this gain um, support from Omar. Um, the conquest of Jerusalem um, occurred in starting in 632 um, and was finished in 637, uh, excuse me, 636 and finished in 637. Um, and Jerusalem would only submit um, its, uh, or um, yeah, submit under um, the sort of direct supervision of Omar himself. So Omar came and met with the um, patriarch of Jerusalem, Sophronius, um, and this is sort of the famous story of um, Omar coming and um, being asked to pray in the Church of the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem and refusing to do so for fear that it might be converted into a, a Muslim place of worship and instead praying next door to it. And this idea of the Mosque of Omar emerged. Um, we this is quite possibly an, apoc an apocryphal story. Um, but nonetheless, uh, if you go to Jerusalem today, there is still a small area outside of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre that is labeled as the Mosque of Omar, and you can, you can go and um, pray there, and this is supposedly the spot where uh, Omar prayed outside of the church. So, um, the, there were attempts um, by the Byzantines to recapture parts of the territory, and the Byzantines attempted to recapture Egypt. Um, for example, Egypt at this point was seen as sort of the breadbasket of the Middle East, um, and so it was sort of a huge loss for the Byzantines. Um, this was the source, particularly al along the Nile, of a lot of foodstuffs. Um, the Omar, after conquering Egypt, Omar um, and his generals expanded into North Africa, um, etc. Um, let's see. Under Osman, there was quite a lot of uh, reconquest because some of these territories um, were attempting to extricate themselves from the caliphate. Um, so there was quite a lot of um, work done under Osman, the successor to Omar, um, to reconquer areas of Iraq, areas of Iran, um, and uh, areas of Afghanistan. Um, and so this was also um, of concern, but conquest continued uh, under, so conquest basically ceased um, briefly during the first fitna, um, when Ali um, was basically fighting for um, control over the, the caliphate. Um, with a number of people, um, and after the after his rule, uh, her his caliphate was over, um, and uh, the Umayyads uh, were put in place, starting with uh, Muawiyah um, ibn Abi Sufyan. Um, the Umayyads continued to expand the empire significantly. Um, so, under the Umayyads. Um, you saw a significant expansion further into North Africa. Um, you saw a significant expansion uh, into the Iberian Peninsula, um, which was conquered by 711. Um, you also saw, um, or parts of it were conquered um, in 711 and into 721. Um, you also saw expansion into um, further east into Pakistan and even areas of uh, northern modern India, modern-day India. Um, 
And the Umayyads um, themselves continued to expand. It seems as though by this point there was um, enough of a sort of standing army presence that there was almost a, a sort of inherent drive or need to continue to expand, to put this army um, to good use and to continue um, to spread the message of, of Islam, um, such as it was during the early period. Um, so there's a lot that I want to say, but I think that we should go into questions. I want to know sort of what you'd like to focus on um, in terms of how the conquests in particular relate to conversion and vice versa. Um, sure. There are a lot of sort of sub issues. So, um, yeah, why don't you go ahead? All right. I mean, kind of going back to some stuff that you mentioned uh, earlier, what was your reason to expand? I mean, I understand at the time of Abu Bakr that, you know, you kind of have these rebellions and you have to deal with these rebellions. Right. But after that, I mean, what was the reason, like, for them to go further and as far as they actually did? Right. I mean, so this is a huge debate in, in the field. You have this, certainly there is this sort of missionary zeal, you might say, and that, that's such a sort of Christian term, but I don't think that it is um, inapplicable to the Muslim conquest. You have religious fervor. You have a message that you want to spread. I mean, the message of the Quran is deeply, deeply um, focused on um, morality and um, is concerned with um, changing one's morals and changing one's beliefs um, in advance of sort of a, an apocalyptic future, right? Um, and so among many Muslims, many early Muslims, there was the idea that the, the apocalypse was um, imminent, that it would happen very soon, possibly within their lifetimes. And so you have this religious fervor that um, was imbued in the early movement and therefore um, was a huge driving factor um, for the armies. But in addition, you also have, um, I mean, there has been... Um, some scholarship on this. Um, Khaled Blankenship um, wrote a book called The End of the Jihad State about the Umayyad armies and sort of the way in which um, maintaining the army and maintaining these military campaigns almost became an end unto themselves. Um, it was, I mean, conquests in addition to bringing um, new believers unto, uh, under um the domain of the caliphate also brought in quite a lot of uh, income, spoils of war, essentially. And so um, and it, the army began to expand significantly. So you had this very large army bringing in quite a lot of money. But once this income stops being brought in, then you still have an army that continues to need to be fed, needs to be paid, et cetera, et cetera. And so it almost becomes this sort of cyclical need to continue to expand the conquest, thereby expanding the army, thereby needing to to maintain this army, um, to the point where Blankenship argues that um, this is sort of the cause of the implosion of the Umayyad Caliphate. Um, so that is you know, another possibility, right? Um, and we do see some indication of that being, an, uh, being a factor um, in the conquest. Um, we do have some cases where, so there were quite a lot of rules in terms of taxation and distribution of spoils of war that emerged during this period, um, and um, to the point that sometimes there were treaties that were sort of um, constructed after after the uh, the fact. Excuse me. I think that there is a. I don't know if you can hear the ambulance behind me, but... Okay, it's almost gone. Um, so you have... Um, uh, there were two ways that a city or a community um, could essentially capitulate to uh, the Muslim armies. And um, they could either do so peaceably um, under a temporary treaty, um, or they could, um, quote unquote, submit by force, um, which is to say um, that they fought the armies before finally capitulating. And so you had distinctions between whether a, um, um, 
whether yeah whether these communities were um, taken by force or by peace um, or peaceably, and this had an effect on what happened to the spoils from um, from the community, the spoils of war. Um, if a community was um, fought, or if a community fought before capitulating, then the spoils of war, which were considered to be forcefully taken, were then subject to the homes, the 20% tax. Um, but if the city um, submitted peacefully, then um, the spoils of war were considered to be fight, which is to say that um, all of it was, all of the sort of resulting spoils of war were then um, able to be distributed to um, participants in the conquest um, without being taxed. And so sometimes um, records of what, you know, which cities were conquered in what ways and how they submitted, um, we have evidence of them sort of being revised um, in order to benefit the, um, the soldiers who actually took the town um, in order to, to grant them more spoils of war. Um, and so, right. Um, so there are, I mean, so these are some of the motivations. Um, I mean, I wanted to circle. But I, I think, yeah, go ahead. Well, I wanted to circle back on something you said about eminent apocalypse, um, like the frenzy associated with that. Why did it manifest itself in, in conquest, in war? Right. So I'm using all of these sort of military terms, but ultimately this was, it wasn't necessarily, um, it was, the idea was sort of to, to save people to bring people in line with the, the message of the Quran, to bring them into the fold of Muslims, uh, into the fold of people who would be saved, right? Um, on the last day, on the, uh, sort of at the, at the apocalypse. So this was you know, done militarily, but with the idea of sort of saving people, saving these communities, you know, you spread the message, um, then there's no way that they, you know, um, have not made the choice to, to become part of the, they have, they've been able to make the choice. If they've heard the message of the Quran, um, then they are able to choose whether to join the Muslim movement and thereby be saved or to reject it and thereby, you know, face whatever consequences may come, right? Okay. And, and you had mentioned the Sasanian and Byzantine empires. Uh, what were they? Uh, where were they located in relation to um, where the, the early Islamic uh, movement was emerging from? So this is the part where I wish I had a map. Um, so if you look at the Middle East, um, the Middle East basically comprises areas, I mean, this varies depending on who you ask, but for the most part, it comprises the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, in the North, we usually think of this as Turkey, the Anatolian Peninsula. Um, and in the South, um, I think our furthest West uh, border is usually considered to be Egypt. Um, though, of course, the early Caliphate extended far beyond these uh, um, far west of Egypt um, and far south as well. Um, the Byzantine Empire was based out of Constantinople, which was in um, modern-day Turkey, um, in the Anatolian Peninsula. Um, and the Byzantine Empire, the, which is you know essentially the Eastern Roman Empire, um, comprised areas of Anatolia, um, south into Syria, um, Jordan, Israel, Palestine, um, Lebanon, as well as Egypt, a few areas, um, parts of Libya, um, areas slightly further to the south, um, and then um, up into basically northern Syria, bordering on what is now Iraq. Um, the Persian Empire, um, or the Sasanian Empire, directly bordered it to the east. Um, you had the capital of the Sasanian Empire was Tesfahan, which is outside of modern-day Baghdad um, in Iraq, um, and comprised significant portions of Iran, Iraq, um, as well as areas of Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and um, where else am I thinking of? Afghanistan, um, small portions of Pakistan, etc. Um, and the two of them, for several hundred years, for several decades, had um, excuse me, yeah, um, had been struggling over um, sort of territory. Um, the two were bordered basically um, in the mountainous regions um, of northern Iraq um, and of um, 
far eastern sort of Syria, Turkey, that sort of area. Um, and, you know, there were often skirmishes in those areas. Um, and in the decades prior to the rise of the Muslim Empire, um, and essentially during Muhammad's lifetime, there were significant wars, um, a series of wars that had begun um, in the 6th century and continued um, essentially into the 620s. They, they stopped less than 10 years before the area um, began to see um, evidence of the Islamic conquest or began to see um, Muslim conquerors emerge into the region. Um, and in fact, Muhammad was uh, born in what is called the Year of the Elephant, um, in which, uh, which is remembered as the year in which a, um, a sort of proxy war was occurring um, between um, the Byzantine, Byzantines and the Sasanians. The Byzantines were allied with the Aksumites um, of Ethiopia, who were Christian, um, and the Sasanians were allied with um, the uh, the Yemenis, the Hemiarites, um, who were Jewish and um, who were based in Yemen, and the two of um, these two groups had been fighting on and off. Um, and in the year of the elephant, um, the Ethiopian ruler Abraha brought a war elephant um, to the battlefield. So that is sort of what this is remembered as. Um, and so, which is to say that the Byzantines and the Sasanians had a essentially sort of um, affiliate tribes and affiliate groups um, in and around the Arabian Peninsula to the south of both of their territories um, who sometimes were um, fought on their behalf. Um, in areas north of the Arabian Peninsula, this was the Ghassanids on the side of the Byzantines and the Wahmids on the side of the Sasanians. Um, and further south, you had the Hejaz and the area where uh, Muhammad and his movement emerged. Um, so when you first see records of the conquest um, among non-Muslims, um, at first they assume that this is just another skirmish, you know, from people to the south, from the Arabs who they mostly knew as either caravan traders or occasional raiders, right? Um, so the first documentations that we have of Muslims um, emerging into areas of Syria um, or southern Iraq are just sort of records of, oh, you know, here was another raid, kind of like the ones that we've seen before. Um, and this is, you know, nothing major. There's no mention of any sort of religious movement just yet. Um, that came a few decades later um, when the Byzantines and the Sasanians and those keeping records um, realized this was, that this was significantly more important. This was much, much more than, than sort of a standard raid or a standard trading expedition, right? And so you had mentioned that um, the Byzantines and the Sasanians were at, you know, constant war with each other. Did this right. somehow um, affect the ease with which the early Muslims kind of conquered these areas? What, I guess, what oh, factors absolutely. led to, uh, I mean, I mean, this is, I mean, we're talking about like, a, I guess, a smaller, in terms of number, the number of uh, this time was considerably smaller than, and I think you're going to eventually discuss more about what it means to be Muslim at this period, but... Right. Um, the, um, the the Sassanians and you know the Byzantines. I mean, they were much larger, much more experienced. Um, I mean, how, how exactly were they defeated? Right. So the as you said, the Sassanians and the Byzantines by this point had quite a lot of experience. Um, they had been fighting on and off um, for since I think the la the last war had begun. Depending on who you ask, maybe six oh two, maybe prior to that in the sixth century. Um, but these wars had been happening regularly throughout the 6th century into the 7th. Um, the last most sort of intense campaign began in 614 and ended in 628. Um, Jerusalem was briefly captured. Um, Heraclius, um, the leader of the Byzantine Empire, um, eventually reconquered much of his territory. Um, a, the true cross, so to speak, um, had been stolen from Jerusalem by the Sasanians, and Heraclius went back into Sasanian territory, reconquered his, um, reconquered this land, and then brought the true cross sort of triumphantly back to Jerusalem, and this happened in, in 628, right? And then, of course, um, a few years later, um, 
Omar and his uh, Omar's army sort of entered the um, the city. But at this point, both um, both Empire's armies and perhaps more importantly, both armies' um, treasuries had essentially been not wiped out, but certainly the treasuries were all but empty. Um, these leaders were um, had exhausted many of their resources um, fighting this war, and so. First, there was, I think, um, a neglect to even see what was happening to the South because there was such a, a focus on, you know, this neighbor next door that the idea that you would see an invasion from, you know, another party is um, not really, you know, in mind whatsoever. And then, of course, once you do see these, these armies coming through, um, you don't necessarily have the resources to muster that you might have had had you not been fighting a war for several decades. But ultimately, it is not entirely clear how it was possible for the Muslim armies to overpower um, these huge empires. I mean, you're right, they were in, they were quite small in comparison. You know, the, um, the Caliphal army was, compared to the Byzantine and Sasanian armies, you know, much smaller. This was still a very early movement. You know, it had the support of various Arabian tribes, some of whom had to um, be sort of reconquered to be brought back into the army. And so um, this was sort of a, a major, major feat um, by this group. And so uh, were, they, were they aware of what was going on around them? Were they aware of the conflicts between the Byzantines and the Sasanians, of um, depleting resources, um, of the, I guess, the political situations within each empire? Were they aware of all this? I mean, did they... I mean, they they feel like there is an opportune time to go ahead with whatever they're doing, or is it just, I don't know, pure luck? Right. That is also not clear to us. So we know that they were certainly aware of the fact that these two empires had been fighting for quite some time. I mean, we see this even in sort of indirect references, like this year of the elephant reference, right? Um, they knew that these two empires were um, sort of constantly at odds with one another. I don't think what they... What we don't see any indication of is whether um, they knew that these armies and that these empires um, were basically depleted by the time um, the Caliphal army sort of pushed forward into, or pushed north sort of into um, the Byzantine and Sasanian territory. That, we don't really see any indication that that was something that the Muslim armies was, uh, were aware of. Were the people that were being conquered, you know, people in the outskirts and in smaller areas, right. uh, how receptive were they of the Muslim armies, of, you know, being ruled by Muslims? Uh, is this something that they, uh, do we have evidence of, you know, how they reacted to these types of things? Do we know if they liked it, if they didn't like it? Right. So we have some evidence in some contexts. Um, one of the groups that we know best are sort of heterodox um Christian groups, which is to say, when I say heterodox, I mean non-Chalcedonian. The Byzantine Empire um, had taken, um, had officially sanctioned a Chalcedonian Christianity, um, and there had been a number of schisms in the, the church in um, the 5th and 6th centuries, um, particularly the 5th, as well as centuries prior. Um, and so there were a number of groups that were considered to be not a part of the Byzantine church who were um, occasionally persecuted by Byzantine officials. And when the Muslim armies came through and sort of conquered the area, they were then suddenly free to worship as they please. Um, and of course, this was also the case for Jews. Um, when the Jews had been exiled from Jerusalem for several hundred years, and when um, the city was taken over by Muslims, they were suddenly allowed back in. Um, and so there were religious minority groups in particular who were quite pleased, we know, um, and this is recorded, who were quite pleased about the fact um, that they were no longer under Byzantine rule. Um, the Byzantine elites, of course, were not happy about this. Many of them fled, from what we can tell, um, back to areas that remained under Byzantine control pretty pretty quickly after the conquest. Um, we have evidence of this from Egypt. We have evidence of this from um, coastal areas of the Levant, Syria, Lebanon, um, Israel, Palestine. Um, I'm using sort of modern country sort of uh, names at this point, but you get a general sense of sort of where these areas are. Um, the Sasanian Empire, it's, it's less clear. I mean, there was a significant amount of religious freedom under the Sasanians. Uh, Zoroastrianism was the 
the official religion of the empire, but minority religions were free to practice as they please. And so um, we see fewer indications of sort of positive responses to the conquest. Um, and then in addition, I mean, I've talked about elites, I've talked about, you know, minority religious groups, but in terms of people who were living in sort of maybe rural villages or nomadic communities or areas where there wasn't a strong administrative presence, you know, first of all, we have very few records of, of what these people were thinking or what they were saying. And, you know, of course, this would have varied significantly depending on where you were. Um, but we also have, um, it is more than likely that, you know, this just seems like, you know, to these people, this was much more of a sort of like, oh, we have a different empire now. That means that there will be a different ca tax collector coming through once a year or something like that. At this point, especially areas that were on the border between the Byzantine and the Sasanian empires, these territories had changed hands so frequently over the past few decades that it almost, you know, was irrelevant, you know? Um, it, you know, hopefully whoever this new group was, you know, could bring peace um, and would avoid, you know, prevent um, fighting from happening in the region. And, and hopefully that was that, you know, that is as good a guess as we have at this point, um, having very few records from areas far from administrative centers, right? Understood. And um, I want to move on to, I guess, some, something that's a bit more of um, your, your, your specialty. But what was the nature of conversion like? You spoke a little bit about it. But, you know, were there people like converting in droves? Um, how exactly did people convert? Were there incentives to convert? Um, and what was the rate right. of conversion? Right. Okay. So I can answer some of these questions thoroughly and others I can't answer at all, but I can tell you sort of where we are in terms of the research today. Um, so conversion in the early period, um, what did it look like? First of all, uh, we don't totally know. Um, more than likely, there was a sort of ritual in the sense that you would recite the Shahada um, as a testament of your, your new um, affiliation, religious affiliation. Um, but even the Shahada itself um, changed during the first two centuries um, of um, Islam. Um, for quite some time, people only seem to have had to recite the first half of the Shahada, there is no God but God, um, and did not have to recite the second half, which is, you know, the Prophet, um, and Muhammad is, his, is the Prophet of God, right? Um, and so the first half of the Shahada um, does not conflict with any Christian or Jewish beliefs um, whatsoever. You know, this is sort of strict monotheism. Um, it does not actively reject anything in the um, sort of Jewish or Christian doctrines um, during this time period. Um, and so it is quite possible that you had um, Christians and Jews converting without actually, you know, rejecting their former um, religious communities or their former beliefs um, by the sometime in the second century history, by sometime in the eighth century common era, you do see the second half of the Shahada becoming standardized. Um, you also see um, some records going a step further and including as part of the Shahada saying something like, you know, um, there is no God but God and he has unto him no partners, which is um, from a Muslim perspective, sort of a, an act of rebuke of the Trinity, um, the Christian Trinity. And so um, that was sort of not standardized. You also have a question of sort of, you know, what Islam even was during this time period, right? Um, during the early period, you have, um, first, during the first and second century history, um, and in some cases even into the third century history, I mean, you have, um, you have stories of the prophet and sort of what he said and what he did during his lifetime and his companions and sort of the history of the early community. You have the Quran, which becomes standardized um, a few decades after um, Muhammad's lifetime. And beyond that, I mean, that's mostly what you have as uh, somebody who might be interested or somebody who might be, uh, might want to know more about Islam. You didn't have 
standardized forms of exegesis of tafsir. You didn't have methods, a sort of standard methods of interpreting the Quran, right? None of that was really present. You see early emergent, you know, scholars, right? Um, Mukatil, um, for example, um, but um, who, you know, even later was sort of um, rejected for some of his methods. Um, you did not have um, standard ways of interpreting the Sharia, right? Um, you didn't you had the sort of early emergence of the sul fiqh but you didn't really have any sort of standardized um, structures in place. Um, I mean, our, our main Sunni legal scholars um, didn't, you know, um, emerge. Like, Abu Hanifa, I think, was living, I mean, during the, the second century history completely. So during the first century, you know, you don't really have all of these sort of things that we consider um, foundational to Islam. You simply have the Quran, you have Muhammad and um, his companions and, you know, stories about their lives, and that's it. Even even the idea of a hadith, a report, right, um, wasn't standardized, you know. You, you didn't have any sort of concept of an isnad, a chain of transmission um, from the our earliest cities often lack um, standard um, or full chains of transmission. Um, you didn't have um, any sort of formal scho- sort of formal scholarly apparatus these were all developing um, and so people it was unclear if you had to completely leave your old beliefs behind it was unclear sometimes what you were even joining there were we have some cases of people joining the Muslim armies without realizing that that meant that they became Muslim um, there's a famous case of um, a man named Cyrus of Haran um, who joined the army, um, received a pension, and once he retired, um, was arrested for going to church. And it is unclear sort of what was happening, but um, he basically made the case that he had never converted to Islam, um, that he had fought as a Christian the entire time. Um, and so this sort of had to be worked out. We also have other evidence of um, non-Muslims joining the Muslim armies you know, en masse without necessarily converting or understanding that they had um, that they had to convert in order to, to become a part of this, this um, movement, both militarily and, you know, and sort of uh, this religious movement, right? Um, so, okay, how many of these, how many of your questions have I answered? I'm not actually sure. Uh, I think a decent amount, but I just wanted to follow up. Um, <laughs> yeah. So... It, but like in terms of the conversion itself, I mean, we were discussing how at the earliest period there's really no like, the shahada was there, but it was in this very basic form. You know, you just I bear witness that there is no god, or I bear witness. I'm sorry, bear witness that there's no god except Allah, or in other um, versions that there's no god but God, and there's no partner with Him. Right. When Muslims were kind of going about and 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 trying to get people to say these things what, what what did they think i mean did they think okay these people are muslim and the people themselves they're like okay we're not really we don't know what we're signing away or did they know that they were signing um something or i mean how how exactly what was that we are not entirely sure um we know by the second century history by the eighth century we have cases where people are clearly leaving their old religious communities behind to join a new community we know that um these non-Muslim communities are concerned about that um, and that their responses to it sort of change over time. Um, we have um, a couple of church canons um, in, from they written in Syriac, for example. Um, in the um, first century history, um, we have an example of somebody, <clears throat> excuse me, who can who converts or a woman converts um, for purposes of um, I think for purposes of marriage, although she didn't have to at the time. Um, and there was a question of whether she should be allowed back into the community should she change her mind, right? Um, and should she decide to, to come back um, to, their, to the sort of Christian community and come back and go to church and that sort of thing. Um, and the priest decides to be lenient because, you know, if they are lenient, then maybe she will come back, and maybe others who have left the church um, for and you know converted to Islam will come back and join the church. Um, we see a similar case emerge about 100 years later, 150 years later maybe, and um, the response is much, much harsher. Not only 
you know, somebody who converts or somebody who even marries um, a Muslim, in, um, in this case it would have been a, mo a woman marrying a Muslim, um, not only can they not ever come back to the church, they are excommunicated and so are their parents. Um, and this is meant to serve as a warning as opposed to an incentive. It's a warning for other members of the community. If you leave, you can't ever come back, right? Um, and so you do see this sort of shift in an understanding that if you convert to Islam, this is a permanent shift. Um, and of course, this also ties into concerns about sort of um, a loss of, of believers, a loss of souls. And um, from the, the Christian perspective and from the Muslim perspective, this is about sort of gaining believers, gaining souls. Um, Fred Donner um, has written a book called Muhammad and the Believers in which he makes the case that um, even the Quran is not necessarily clear about um, the distinction between a believer, a mu'min, right, and a Muslim, a submitter, um, and sort of what that is intended to, to imply. Um, and so I think that sort of his argument is that, particularly during the first century history, um, that plays out as sort of a confusion um, as to who is joining the movement and, you know, what they understand that movement to be comprised of and even what Muslims themselves considered um, to be, um, you know, the community and who was a part of it and who was not. Were there any incentives to convert financial incentives or any other types of incentives? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Um, so, Non-Muslims who were Christian or Jewish um, were considered al kitab, right, people of the book, and they were considered dhimmis, um, which is to say um, people who were um, under the protection of the caliphate um, and the protection of the Muslim armies um, by extension. Um, therefore, in theory, at least they, they themselves could not join the army, although we already know that that is not the case and that, you know, many Christians and Jews did. Um, certainly Christians, I've... I've encountered many, many cases of them um, joining the army without converting. Um, but the exchange for this is that they have to pay higher taxes, right? Um, this is called the jizya. Um, they pay a sort of extra poll tax. Um, and this is understood to be sort of um, for their the protection of the caliphal army. Um, so what that means in reality is that um, if you convert to Islam as a Christian or a Jew, suddenly your taxes are significantly reduced, right? So there's a, a, a major financial incentive to convert. Um, beyond that, um, we also see effects of this playing out, particularly in, in, in major cities, in administrative centers. If you, during the early um, sort of expansionary period of the caliphate, during the Rashidun era, during the early Umayyad era, um, the caliphate, the empire expanded so rapidly that um, in terms of the administration of the empire, um, in many cases, Byzantine and Sasanian uh, administrators were simply kept on to continue the smooth functioning of, um, of the sort of administrative apparatus, taxation, um, um, and sort of maintenance of cities. There was a, a figure um, called the... Um, who sort of maintained the marketplace um, in the Greek? This was called the agoronome. Um, sort of, and he was the market in inspector, um, and he was essentially translate transferred um, into sort of, or like um, in the sort of early caliphate was considered to be the amelasuk, um, and this sort of figure and his role were sort of maintained um, without any real changes whatsoever. And eventually, this emerged into the the role of the mahtasid. Um, but a lot of these sort of figures, um, many of the people who were working those um, in those positions were just kept on. Um, when the Caliph Abdul Malik uh, came to power, he required that um, there be a sort of change in administration. Um, he prioritized Muslims in these roles, and he also changed the language of the empire um, to Arabic, and Arabic then became the official language of empire. Prior to that, Greek had been used at least as frequently, particularly among or certainly among Byzantine, former Byzantine territories. Um, and so all of that is to say, if you are in, you know, these administrative centers, it, after the first few decades, you know, during and then after the conquest, um, it became um, very beneficial for you to be Muslim. You know, at first this wasn't a problem. You could continue to be um, a member of the elite, 
without converting. You know, you could be Christian, you could be Jewish, you could be, you know, anything else. Well, maybe not anything else, but um, it was not a concern if you were not a Muslim. But um, by about the uh, maybe the second century history or so, um, it would be a problem for you to be a non-Muslim and to be, to desire a role in the administration. Um, And so conversion could increase your social standing. It could increase your, it could improve your job prospects. Um, It could expand your social network significantly. Um, And of course, if you were in a religious community where you were not in, um, uh, among the elites, if you were, you know, from a small village and you were um, having a, um, if you were struggling financially or sort of in a um, lower class status situation, what you could do is move to the cities, convert to Islam, and essentially sort of start over and sort of rise through the, um, through society as a Muslim, and you would have a better chance of doing so as a Muslim. Um, so there were certainly financial, social incentives. Um, and then, of course, you know, you can never truly assess the sort of religious experience that someone has, the, the experience that someone has that motivates them to, to convert to Islam for religious reasons. Um, but certainly, you know, we see many, many cases of that as well um, from individuals. And so it seems like it's a administrative nightmare, especially in the earlier uh, periods, like right after, during the conquests, you have all these smaller mm-hmm. rural villages that... Maybe some people in, in those villages convert, they, they speak different languages, uh, perhaps the right. administrative structures that are in these other empires aren't fully utilized or understood yet. How are early Muslims keeping track of all these things, especially when it involves something like money? Right. So in many cases, um, they're, they're not doing so accurately, right? Um, you have the tax collector come to these places once a year or once every few months, um, at, I think Abdul Malik was um, the person, or the caliph who implemented the first census, uh, which was an attempt to count the people in the caliphate and sort of figure out where they were, um, and also to try to assess um, their level of wealth, their land owning, that sort of thing, and to try to figure out, you know, exactly um, how much they owed. Um, what this ended up doing was significantly increasing um, the amount of taxes that people had to pay. Um, and we have evidence in Egypt, for example, of people actually trying to flee their towns in order to avoid the tax collector. So much so that in Egypt, um, many people were issued what you could sort of see as passports or, or state identifications that listed both their name um, and the town where they were from. So if they weren't in that town, they could be arrested and brought back in order to um, pay their taxes um, accordingly, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the more... Um, I study the administration of the early caliphate during and immediately after the conquest, the more the more messy it gets. It doesn't actually get clearer. You find more and more complicating factors, right? Um, so, you know, in that context, it's, it's sort of, it's not totally a free-for-all because certainly the, the administration is doing its best. Um, but in terms of, of figuring out exactly what was going on, it's quite difficult. Um, and in the context of conversion, of course, you know, this sort of chaos doesn't really help us understand what, what exactly was happening um, in terms of the numbers um, of people who are converting and why they say they're converting and, you know, what did that even necessarily mean in this, this very early period, right? What was the, the rate of conversion? How many people converted? Was it a lot of people? Was it a few people? And at what point did we start seeing a lot of these areas become, you know, predominantly Muslim? Right. Um, so we are talking about a region um, that is, um, we certainly have known it for several centuries to have been, to be majority Muslim, right? Um, uh, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, the Levant, Egypt, um, Mesopotamia, all of these, you know, the sort of quote-unquote heartlands of the Middle East, of course, are majority Muslim today and have been for several centuries. So the question is, yeah, when did they become majority Muslim? How did this process occur? Um and there have been several studies that have been done, um, most famously Richard Bullitt's um, conversion to Islam in the medieval period, um, where he focuses on um, Iran, and he looks at sort of um, these tabakat works, these, which are sort of like um, 
short biographical dictionaries um, in which people are described um, and their sort of family connections are described. Um, Bullitt argued that basically um, you could tell who had converted to Islam based on naming patterns, which is to say that if somebody is named Muhammad, which is a Muslim name, of course, um, but his father is named Rustam, which is a Persian name, then, um, and, you know, Rustam's father is named a Persian name that is not Muslim, and, you know, so on and so, far, so forth, then the father, Rustam, must have been the convert, because he's the first to name his son a Muslim name, right? Um, and so, based on this, he sort of tried to um, graph what he had seen, or, you know, what what he had pulled from these biographical dictionaries um, and try to come up with sort of a rate of conversion. Um, and of course, this was done in the late 70s or early 80s um, before we had a lot of the um, analytical tools that we have now. Um, but he came up with, a, with an interesting rate of conversion in which during the early period, during the first century and a half of Islam, you see very few cases of conversion. Um, they expand significantly in um, the late second, early third centuries. Um, and um, continue to rise rapidly, particularly during the um, third and fourth centuries history. Um, and sort of the rate of expansion sort of levels off from there. But you continue, you know, you go from a minority to a majority um, around the maybe late ninth, early tenth centuries, um, common era. And since then, I mean, people have pointed out flaws in his methodology. Certainly the um, bibliographical dictionaries focus on the elites, right? And to name your um, son a Muslim name doesn't, I mean, it does imply that you're Muslim, but it doesn't necessarily imply that your father naming you Rustam was not, uh, right? So there are, you know, questions about sort of the methodologies um, used here. Nonetheless, we haven't seen any sort of large-scale studies of conversion or the rate of conversion um, since then that have been even remotely as successful, right? Um, I've only seen one or two attempts since then, and, and I've been far less convinced by, by their results um, than I was of bullets. And of course, I have concern about um, bullet study as well. So when it comes to the rate of conversion, um, I've seen in the context of Egypt and Spain, I've seen other attempts. Um, there have been attempts, um, particularly in Egypt, to take a look at the rate of the shift, the Arabization of the region, which is to say the shift in language patterns from Coptic and Greek, but mostly Coptic, over to Arabic, right? And that happens um, in Egypt much later than sort of Bullet's graph of Iran. Um, in Egypt, we see evidence of Arabic language use um, overtaking the use of Coptic, particularly in vernacular context, from the 11th to the 13th centuries, mostly. A couple of waves starting, maybe starting in the 9th century, but for the most part, this happens a couple of centuries later. Um, now, Arabization doesn't necessarily correlate with conversion, right? But it does imply that there's some sort of connection. Um, increased use of Arabic is tied to um, the study of the Quran, the um, you know incorporation of sort of um, um, the, the sort of official administrative language of the empire um, being brought down into sort of like the everyday. Um, and so, and it also sort of implies, I mean, if you convert to Islam, the continued use of Coptic um, is sort of by this point or by the, the medieval period seen as associated with Coptic Christianity. And so um, there is sort of a connection between Arabic and Islam in Egypt and Coptic and you know, Christianity. Um, and so um, more than likely this Arabization in terms of language is correlated to, to large-scale conversion during those centuries, but we're not exactly sure how um, or how closely they're intertwined, right? And, you know, we can't really, we can't um, create numbers out of, out of that, under, that knowledge. 